Right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome back to the land of low friction. Sorry it's been a minute since the, uh, the last video, but uh, yes, everything's always busy on all fronts, but we're back. Um, so today's, um, so the first one out we're going to try is um, part two of the muck off files. Now this is, a, this is a tough one, so apologies for Michael Files part one. I did that one really poorly, tired, not enough prep. Um, I've uh, increased caffeine and tried to actually prep um, for this one, but uh, this isn't my day job. So I don't have like a, um, uh, obviously a screen prompt and I don't have a super effective way of trying to, you know, read on camera all the stuff that I've sort of uh, prepped out. And if I try to um, uh, just remember it all, I'll get off track and rambly like I did in, in part one. So uh, we're gonna try more editing. So there might be more cuts in and out today. So, but we'll see if I can do a better job uh, on this one than I did on part one. And this is really the wrap. Um, and so I guess in part one, I had a lot of concerns. Uh, today I'm gonna to be uh, overall a fair bit, I guess, stronger in the, the I guess the conclusions that I believe uh, has happened. And they're, uh, to me, they're really, you know, they're pretty bad, pretty uh, worrisome, but, um, yeah, and like I'm not, it's not really my natural thing to try to make anything kind of sensationalist or to try to, you know, make something big out of nothing. But yeah, out of probably any situation uh, so far in the in the land of, you know, pretty narrow focus of bicycle chain lubrication and, uh, and, and this side of the industry, you know, thankfully there's not been, I guess, you know, too much really worrisome stuff. But but this one is is to me, it's, it's probably the, the worst case of what we've seen. So... Um, now if you think I'm being a bit harsh on um, Markov with all this, then you know definitely at the end of the video, put in why you think you know I, I'm wrong or I'm being too harsh or if I'm just just way off base. Um, but yeah, try to make sure. I, mean, I guess as much as everything these days tends to be filled with um, you know influences and you know just sort of you know, blind blind supporters and so on really try to make any input if possible sort of fairly factual and, and, and logic based as, as to what what you think um, you yeah, know if you've got a different uh, take or, or opinion versus what I'm going to be sort of presenting to you uh, today and um, it's been a long uh, investigation really so um, mostly that's been just because it's been so hard to actually get uh, I guess any information uh, from Markov and I haven't really wanted to you know put forward some really strong um, you know I'm going to put what what are my personal uh, conclusions read the situation without really giving them the opportunity to um, you know I guess combat my uh, or allay my concerns and so um, it took a long time but finally I did get that call which I sort of ran through a little bit in part one uh, with the muck off uh, the, the head lab tech guy there and uh, and another guy and I sent a follow-up on that because there were a lot of questions and concerns still unanswered from that call because I wasn't really able to go into the depth uh, on specifics that I wanted to. And they did commit uh, to answering those concerns. Uh, they didn't, uh, followed up, there's been no reply. So in the absence of Markov actually being able to uh, come back to me and address the, the specific concerns I have, it's now time really for me to stop sort of dancing around uh, the concerns and actually say, okay, this is what I believe uh, is actually has gone on um, and I'm gonna draw a pretty sort of strong line there and, and that's gonna be my conclusion unless they do actually come out with something that is able to, uh, you know, to, to change that and prove that I'm incorrect. All right, so, um, and just one, I'm gonna do one final preamble bit, sorry, so if you think I'm, um, yeah, going on a, a little bit sort of too hard into this situation or why have I sort of picked this particular situation. Um, I think a frustration of a lot of cyclists overall in a lot of areas of cycling can be how do you cut through the, you know, all the marketing hyperbole on a particular, you know, line of products with this brand battling this brand and they're all trying to more or less find some new thing that they can claim or some new marketing angle that they can spin to try to obviously get you to buy their product over others. And it can get very difficult for you know cyclists to sort of know what you know what is true what is correct what do i buy it i don't know you know who to believe here because i've got 15 helmets that all claim that they're the fastest and there's 20 bike frames that all claim that they're the fastest and there's you know 25 wheel sets that all claim that they're the fastest and and it's really hard to to narrow that down when it comes to bicycle chain lubricants this has probably been one of really the worst areas um uh, for just claim whatever you like without any uh sort of accountability because nobody's really I guess, you know, sort of able to prove or hold these things to account. So it's 
been pretty much the wild west of claim a whole bunch of wondrous things that the lubricant does such as it cleans as it lubricates and protects contamination from being able to abrade on your chain metal and all, all this stuff um, and you know and some even claim they condition the, 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 the metal as they go so and and there's been you know really just go for whatever you like um, and there's there's just nothing that sort of comes back on that so it's very very confusing um, and you only have to look at the range I mean there are just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lubricants out there all vying for you to try to buy them so it's a pretty big marketing game and the reason why overall the I guess for me this situation differs to your typical marketing um, battle is that uh, there's been a bit more uh, I think nefarious behavior going on behind the marketing campaign which I'll I'll step through as, as I go through the actual uh, the testing side so that's why for me this one has really sort of stood out you know there, there's been a bunch of lubricants that I've tested and reviewed which have had really you know way off base marketing such as when wax went to market with a rub on wax that gives you a race ready chain in seconds whereas obviously if you rub a solid on the outside of your chain you have no lubrication inside your chain and then they wanted you to dissolve that lubricant in with a wax off then they released it in colors um, you know and, and the market went you know sort of pretty strong on that so th there's a lot of you know products that have come to market with really I would say just very untrue marketing campaigns that sit behind the product uh, but this one goes further so uh, that'll that'll be a bit of a enough of a, of a ramble on from me to, to start with but hopefully it sort of sets the case a bit as to, to why you know this has really been something of, of pretty big concern to me and I think it, it's just something that I feel pretty passionate about that you know cyclists out there should know because muck off don't care what I think they don't care what noise I make about it they're, they're only going to care if something starts to impact, you know, their sort of customer attention or their money coming in. And that's only going to come from yourselves if you also agree and believe. And if, you know, uh, cyclists out there vote with their, with their dollars on products that uh, I guess are, you know, and companies that are worthy of your hard-earned money and not companies that, uh, that I think can do a lot better. Um, so that's to set the, set the tone. All right, so... There's going to be really two main concerns that I'm going to address um, with Muckoff today. Concern one is their testing. So now I have covered um, testing before. So um, for the full um, information on that, number one, check out episode 11, where I step through the big basket case issues that is lubricant efficiency testing at the moment, where I explain in more depth the difference uh, between full tension testing and full load testing. I'm going to do a little recap on that today, even though I have covered it before in that video and I covered it a bit, I think in part one, just because it's really key to this, uh, this concern. And if you haven't seen those in the next section may not make any sense. Um, but overall, full tension testing is a setup where, um, and we should get some pictures uh, that we'll put up um, similar to the previous episode, where you have a chain ring and a cog and the cog is pulled back by a weight adding tension to both the top and bottom span of the chain there's no rear mech so there's less noise in the system it, in terms of testing um, a, a lubricant or chain efficiency when you have a very accurate machine set up to do this with say a mechanical torque sensor at the front end and at the rear um, the losses between the chain ring and the cog basically that is going to be your your losses and if you've got the same chain, you've got a calibrated chain, you know what its baseline is and all you're changing is the lubricant, then you're able to very, very um, accurately test the efficiency losses for that lubricant. However, not all, but most lubricants, um, if they are kept on for a long run on these full tension test machines, the lubricant is not able to refresh um, through the bottom span of the drivetrain. In a normal bicycle drivetrain, the bottom span is under very low tension the lubricant is able to basically refresh and, and realign on the main load surfaces ready for the next load cycle. Without that refresh and realignment, many, many lubricants, what happens is after a certain time, it may be, you know, five minutes, it may be 30 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, is that you'll get a very sudden or very, I guess, sharp and notable increase in the losses uh, being recorded for that uh, chain. Um, and that will continue to climb when it's run. But then if it is stopped, and then the chain is rested and then it is restarted, it goes back to where it was um, initially for the first you know, X amount of time before that started. So 
This was discovered by Jason Smith in the friction fax days when he made this full tension test machine as the most accurate way to uh, test lubricant efficiency losses. But he discovered what was, uh, what was occurring there and then realized that really if he's going to be testing lubricants over a longer period, then what's called a full load test machine needs to be built, which is basically then a test machine that is set up exactly like a bicycle drivetrain. So it has a, a rear mech on the bottom and it runs through, so there is the slackening time. And the gold standard process was set up that you would initially, after the chain's been prepped uh, and everything calibrated, you run a test on the full tension test machine to get your efficiency loss point. Then for any extended run time past basically about a minute or five minutes, the chain is then moved to the full load test machine. And then it is moved back, be it every 30 minutes or hour or whatever the, the test protocol that they're going to be uh, using, uh, back to the full tension test machine to get the data point for the efficiency loss of the lubricant uh, after that you know, X amount of running. So that was, I guess, you know, really well established in the friction facts days with Jason Smith, and that was all published. And one of the services Jason Smith uh, used to offer at the time was also assisting with other manufacturers who were wanting to build their own um, you know, chain lubricant efficiency testing setup so that they can have that same level of machine and testing going in their own labs to develop their own lubricants, benchmark them against competitors. One of those clients was, was Muckoff, so they consulted heavily with Jason Smith. Um, I can't actually, sorry, use the word heavily. I don't know how heavily they did consult. I know they consulted with Jason Smith at the time. Um, and they have, so in there, and we'll have these uh, pictures come up. So there is, uh, we can see from their nano chain launch brochure, they have a picture of a test machine they call Clod, which is, you can clearly see that is a full tension uh, test machine. And they have, uh, we'll get another picture to uh, come up which is, uh, again, a picture from their own um, site, which is clearly a full load tension machine because we can see that it has the, uh, the rear mech so that there is a slackening time through the bottom. So they consulted with Jason Smith, um, who obviously would have advised pretty clearly. And, when, and they're not, he's not dealing with, um, with silly people on the other end here at Muckoff. The, the guy running the lab at Muckoff, um, Martin, someone, sorry, if I do forget his last name, uh, he has a PhD and working on his second PhD, I believe. So when you've got somebody like super smart like Jason Smith working with uh, obviously a super smart guy at the other end at Muckoff, going through why they need obviously a full tension test and a full load test machine and Muckoff having their own pictures in their own brochures of a full tension test and a full load test machine. I think we can draw a conclusion that they know why they have both machines and how they need to use both machines. It doesn't make any sense that they would have both machines. They, they cost a lot of money each. The torque sensors on these machines cost, a, the ones that Friction Facts use and Ceramic Speed use now are like $6,000 US each at, at each end. So, and then you've got a, a whole lot of other engineering and setup to go with that. So uh, I believe the Friction Facts machines and Ceramic Speed machines are around 25,000 US each. They're not cheap. You're not gonna build a machine you don't know why you're building it. So I think we can draw a conclusion that muck off, understand why you need a full tension test machine and a full load test machine and how to use the two. So um, if we've established that, then I guess what we confirmed during the call, uh, with, so it had long been a concern, so Muckoff, as part of their nano um, lube launch, they launched, um, a, I guess, a bunch of test data showing obviously nano lube to be low to low friction, I think it was about four watts, and they showed one of their key competitors uh, at the time, which was then, say, Ceramic Speed with a UFO drip. They showed UFO drip starting to rapidly increase in friction losses at the, just the 18 minute mark. And it had a 10 watt loss um, in just the four hours of the testing that they, that they ran the test on. Now, pretty obviously, uh, say to myself and to some others, and obviously Ceramic Speed, Jason Smith, who was then at Ceramic Speed from Friction Facts, that it looked pretty clear that this test was would have just been com conducted on a full tension test machine only, and that explains the uh, runaway results. Um, Ceramic Speed released a open letter response to that, and they also were able to replicate actually that exact result by doing the exact same thing of just using their FTT test machine. Um, the the, the Markov testing also had other key competitors like say Squirt, which was, um, had been really well highlighted from the Friction Facts days as a, as a great low friction lubricant at the time at like eight and a half watts, watts uh, whereas uh, Friction Facts had had it at, at I believe, 4.8 watts. So 
Um, it had long been a concern from that time that they had just used an FTT machine to conduct their testing. And, you know, the big question is, well, why on earth would they do that? So, um, you know, if they know what they're doing with their testing, why would they test uh, in, in a manner that's going to you know, produce obviously incorrect results? And another double check to this is literally basic logic. Um, so the test, these very fancy test machines are there to test the outright efficiency loss of the lubricant for your chain. Now, they've done a test for over four hours. <clears throat> so if anyone thinks that they are going to take, pick any lubricant you like and go for a four hour ride out in the sunshine on a beautiful um, you know, dry conditions day out on the roads and get a 10 watt loss increase from when you started that ride to when you finished, you know, that is just bonkers. Um, that is obviously not going to happen uh, with any lubricant. It wouldn't happen with cutting fluid. So, um, you know, it's again, it just begs in probability that the you know, PhD guy running a test lab is going to get a lubricant that increases by 10 watts from its baseline or basically four watts to over 14 watts in a four hour period in basically, you know, what are perfect conditions in a, in a test lab and call that a valid, accurate test result such that they're going to not only go to print with that result, but they're going to use that result as a basically a centerpiece part, a key part of their um, brochure that they're, that they're launching for their new lube to show how amazing they are and how terrible one of their key competitors are. So some you know, pretty major red flags there. Um, and now finally, so Markov never for a long time um, really responded to any requests for information. So any of the questions and concerns that I was asking them, which are basically those exact concerns that I'm uh, sort of putting to you there. But finally, finally, uh, I was able to get a call, uh, as mentioned with the, the Markov lab, and we sort of ran through, uh, or trying to run through that concern. And so now the head um, lab guy, Martin, he advised that um, yes, they use basically just the FTT testing. Uh, the reason they use the FTT testing is that it provides reliably repeatable results. Um, and also that, you know, this slackening thing was not really sort of on their radar at the time. So I've got, I guess, two really points to kind of counter that. So let me just catch up to where my page is. So, all right, so obviously on the first one, I think that the fact that they're stating that the, uh, this whole you know, slackening thing, as they called it, was not really on their radar at the time, I think from what I've already covered, we can call that, to me, I think we can call that bullshit. I just, it's just impossible to me that you know, the fact that they're working with Jason Smith or getting information, um, regardless of even if he was minimally involved, that would have been covered. We know that that would have been covered because they've got, those two machines shown in their brochure. They have those two machines. They must know why they have these two different machines uh, and what they're doing with them. So I call a complete bullshit on that. Um, now the other thing is, if you, okay, the, re the repeatably reliable results or reliably repeatable results, whichever is the best order to say that. I can get a repeatably reliable result by riding my carbon wheels without the tyres on. That doesn't mean that that's an accurate indicator of how well that wheel is going to ride or perform if I'm using it as it's supposed to be used with the tyre on. So if you know, and I believe they obviously full well knew that the FDT uh, test results were completely you know, incorrect, especially for the competitor lubricants, then um, you know, testing, you can repeatably get that result because that is how the machines behave. It's been established how the machines behave. They've basically just reproven exactly what friction facts had already proven uh, in their groundwork on this. So yes, it's reliably repeatable because that is the issue if you just run um, you know, the full tension test machine for extended periods with a lot of lubricants. So, and, and especially a lot of wax lubricants are, are very affected by that. So you know, that doesn't hold any credence um, to back their um, I guess why they have tested in that manner at all. So my belief overall on this whole testing, um, you know, I guess stuff that we've got from Markov, where to me they have released test results that you know show that some key competitors to be extremely poor. I believe that they have um, tested deliberately in that manner to uh, show their competitors to be extremely poor. 
And you know, basically with that knowledge, so it's gonna link a little bit into part two, but um, if you know what is happening, and if you know what's, you know, with regards to the no slackening time, and if you know that that's going to show up, you know, with the with X, you know, sort of runaway efficiency, efficiency loss results for certain lubricants, and you want to look great against that, then you can choose a base that is not affected by not having the slackening time. So I believe that Markov have chosen a base for their lubricant that is not affected by the slackening time by running the test on the FTT machine. And so then, you know, that, that holds stable uh, during that testing and competitors look really, really poor. So now this isn't going to come from like the head lab guy just going rogue and doing all this by himself because at some stage there'd be a red flag. There'd be somebody in the chain before you go to print going, hey, are we sure? Like that's a really strange result. We've got a lubricant that's increased by 10 watts in just four hours in clean lab conditions. That doesn't make sense. Um, you know, for all of this to happen, all these decisions that would have needed to have been made from, um, you know, basically having, making the decision to test just using the FTT test machine, not the FTT FLT test process that, that has been established, to making sure your lubricant has a base that is not affected by the no slackening time of running for long periods on an FTT machine, going to print with these claims that are obviously you know, going to raise a lot of red flags and just don't pass any logic. For all of that to happen, you know, I believe pretty conclusively uh, for myself, and again, I'm going to state this is my own opinion, was, none of this I'm stating is established empirical fact. I'm just laying out, I guess, what I believe we know at, at the moment. And these are my personal conclusions from uh, all of the investigation we've been trying to do on this, is that I believe that, you know, there is no way this has just happened, uh, you know, with, say, one person going rogue, I believe that this is really stemmed from the top, that basically from the top level down, decisions would have had to have been made to plan and execute this entire strategy, which is extremely concerning. So, and this is where to me it differs versus say a lubricant just going to market with some marketing claims that are complete bullshit. If you go to market having executed a strategy of completely and utterly dodging your testing to show you as being great and a key competitor being extremely poor, that's, that's a level of, I guess, dishonesty and lack of integrity and uh, just overall concern about what on earth is going on with the culture of that company. That is really why I've been, yeah, I guess, highlighting this, this, this whole muck off files. So that's, that's really sort of, to me, next level. And unfortunately, and I've been giving them, you know, I think as hopefully it's sort of come through, to me, I've really given Muckoff every opportunity to allay that concern um, because it's a really big one, and I haven't wanted to put that out, you know, really that that sort of clearly in in text or video. Um, I'm not a sensationalist, so for me to sort of just come out and say it, it's not something I do lightly. Um, I mean, overall, um, so when I started zero friction cycling, um, I had fully expected that I would be stocking, you know, at least one of the top uh, Muckoff products. Um, I, you know, been using their cleaning products personally for for a long time, so it's not like I, I went into this and I can't go into this space with a, you know, a preconceived uh, idea of vendetta against, you know, for or against any company. It's just got to be, if you're going to be the established independent uh, test facility in the bicycle chain lubricant space, then everything has to be on its merits. And and I think hopefully that I've always um, been able to convey that pretty clearly with with the work and um, the detail reviews and everything that that we do. That you know, I take that responsibility of being independent and that everything being put forward is is absolutely you know as the facts present themselves um i take that as seriously really as it can be taken so yeah it's not something that i've really wanted to um you know be sort of that forthright uh, with such serious concerns on something for um you know uh, really for any company so to me it's quite extraordinary that i'm you know sort of putting that out there so but that's it is what it is. I can't. Um, I can't really sugarcoat it. Sort of down any any more from that. I think it's it's quite a quite a shocking state of affairs. Um, and I think that um, Muckoff should respond to it, and you know should respond in terms of trying to prove those uh, concerns incorrect. And if not, as I, as I mentioned at the start, you guys should all let me know what you think. Am I correct or am I not correct, um, and why that is so? All right. Um, I'm going to move on to, because I think I actually managed to cover all of my massive typing prep on that 
uh, without forgetting too much or getting it in the wrong order, which is a mini miracle. All right, so moving on to concern number two. Um, so now, uh, Muckoff, um, during the call that I had with them, they put to me that um, they disagree with the direct link between uh, the wear rate correlation that I use in zero friction testing and the increase in friction, or that, sorry, having a direct link to uh, the friction results in the chain. Now, all right, there's a couple of bits to that. So now, obviously, firstly, <laughs> a little bit funny that the manufacturer with by far, by far the highest wear rates ever recorded for any lubricants, um, is going to disagree with that wear rate correlation. Um, but um, yeah, secondly, uh, I mean, so I'm gonna step through a little bit. The wear rate that I'm measuring throughout the test is obviously the chain, you know, measuring, and therefore the links are being able, sorry, wearing, therefore the links being able to be pulled further apart. Um, that is wear of hardened steel components of the chain. So now if you imagine, if you set two hardened steel components with a frictionless cloth, nothing's gonna happen. If you set to those steel components with bastard file, something pretty notable is gonna happen pretty quickly. So when you've got some really high wear rates occurring, um, then you know, you're going to get, um, you know, it just takes friction for that to occur. So yeah, a lot of um, you know, people much smarter than myself that have reviewed the zero friction cycling testing and the wear rate protocol and engaged in zero friction cycling testing services um, you know, for their lubricants, um, to get data to go, you know, to go public to benchmark their products versus others, and also as part of their own product development. So we've got ceramic speed, silka, malt speed wax, Rex, Revo lubes, Effetto Mariposa, session components, absolute black. So, you know, a lot of people have um, had a look and gone through the protocol, and obviously found that there's quite some validity between the wear rate, which is going to be from friction causing that wear of metal and the friction that is going to be present in the lubricant on your chain. So uh, why do Markov disagree? So Markov disagree, they uh, say from their testing that they have you know, prepared chains with Ludicrous, um, tested them, sent them out for you know, some hard racing or you know, training blocks with, uh, with their athletes. They get them back and they retest them and they're faster. Now, I believe, basically, I 100% believe they didn't confirm, but I, I believe, because there's no other way this would be true, that the fast result is when they've received the chains back, they have cleaned them, retreated them, and then tested them again. That They haven't been testing the chains as they've come back from the field and getting a fast result, because that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen for anything, especially it's not going to happen for uh, lubricants that um, are really showing that they uh, absorb a lot of contamination. So now the other part is that, so they're, they're saying that the Ludicrous conditions the, um, the chain. So, and that's sort of part of what's gonna sit behind the, the, the wear. And it's conditioning the chain by way of, it's removing, I guess, you know, the peaks of the, the, the metal surface. So if you look at chain metal surface under a really powerful microscope, it's not smooth. You've got peaks and troughs. Um, and so by making that surface smoother, it's getting faster. Now there are, um, yeah, I guess, chain conditioning that does occur. Um, and this is part of why we have a break-in for race chains, uh, which is usually done with the factory grease. Um, Silka have a diamond slurry that they use for their uh, chain break-in for their race chains. So to remove the metal um, peaks, that takes friction. Um, and where's the metal going once you remove it? Um, it's, you know, if it's in the lubricant that you're actually using, I don't think anybody would think that adding microfine tiny particles of hardened steel into your lubricant is going to be a low friction additive. That's pretty clearly going to be a, um, you know, a friction increasing uh, product. So nobody you know, in any industry, what they use for the initial uh, metal conditioning or break-in is not the same product that you then use as your lowest friction lubricant. So, you just don't get the two in one. You can't, it, there's no sort of free lunch there. You can't have something that is improving the surface material of the metal by a, a, an abrasive removal action and it also being, you know, the lowest friction option. So there is another way of going about your metal conditioning, which is what most lubricant um, products that, that uh, are looking to do this approach it by, and that is more of an additive where you've got, say, platelets or something like tungsten disulfide that are helping to fill in the troughs 
um, to make the metal smoother and, and plate the metal with something that is super low friction. That's an additive conditioning, not a removing of peaks, which is an abrasive, you know, must take some level of friction type conditioning. That is done if it's going to be done with a different product during a break-in, not as the lubricant that you run on your chain in your racing. So I don't think that that holds um, much uh, sort of credulity myself. And I'd like to see some data from um, Markov of the testing of the chains that come back from the field because the data that I have on what happens with Markov lubricants, and this is the other thing that I think really puts a nail in the coffin of their argument. Um, actually, all of the nails around the entire perimeter of the coffin of their argument because what we see is that the bulk of the wear rate with the Markov lubricants that I've tested really come in when the contamination is introduced during block two of the testing. So we've got the clean block one results, which for Ludicrous was not that bad. It wasn't terrible, it wasn't amazing, but it wasn't terrible. But uh, like Nano and, and Hydro were really bad, but then things get really uh, a whole lot worse as soon as we're in introducing um, contamination. So if the majority of your wear rate that we're uh, seeing in the zero friction, uh, zero friction cycling uh, wear rate correlation testing, if the vast majority of that is coming from when abrasive contamination is introduced, then it is abrasive contamination that is, you know, be that's been absorbed by the lubricant, making the lubricant more abrasive, that is resulting in that wear rate increase. So that's that's got to be pretty clear. We're adding um, abrasive contamination and the wear rate shoots up due to the fact that the abrasive contamination has been absorbed. It, that has to correlate with a pretty notable increase in the friction losses if there's been a pretty notable increase in the wear rate due to that um, abrasive contamination. In short, if there's more abrasive friction, there's more friction. So um, that wear rate doesn't come from nowhere. It's coming from one very specific thing leading to a very specific direct link uh, result. Now, how does it compare? So how, how sort of bad are we talking here? So uh, we'll have a graph pop up now, which is just going to show the wear rate increase just for the dry block two over the block one result. So that's basically saying that we've got a, you know, whatever the X wear rate is in during block one for the lubricants, what is the increase um, that we see during block two when dry contamination is added during that test block? So now we can see that out of all the drip lubricants tested, on average, there is a 16.4% increase in the wear rate recorded in block two versus the wear rate recorded for the lubricants in block one, which is clean, no contamination. The top five drip lubricants that we've tested, uh, which are really Markov's key competitors because you're not going to be paying $90 a bottle for some ludicrous AF for a 50 mil bottle, uh, and not expect that to be a lubricant that you hope to be in the top end of town. So this is really the, the lubricants that Ludicrous AF is competing against. And previous to that, Nano Lube, which was a uh, similar price. Um, the top five drip lubricants tested have recorded an increase during the block two contamination uh, block of just 2.9% over their block one result. So showing that there's very, very, very little increase in the friction of those lubricants during that test block because they really haven't absorbed much of the, uh, the contamination that's being added. For Markov, we have a wear rate increase on average across the three lubricants tested, and they're pretty much within a very tight spread from basically 69% to like 71% across the three Markov lubricants tested. We've got an average of 70.1% increase in wear rate. So it's, it's worn through nearly three quarters of the chain's uh, wear allowance, which is to the recommended replacement mark of the chain just in that 1,000 kilometer test block. So, I mean, that, that is a massive, massive increase from wear, uh, sorry, in wear, and that increase has come directly, categorically and clearly from absorbing abrasive contamination, which absolutely must directly increase the friction of that lubricant on your chain. It is becoming like an abrasive paste mas masquerading as your chain lubricant to absorb that much and increase by that much. So yeah, I think um, like that should be super duper clear. Um, we've got our you know, Milwaukee nail gun out and just gone around the coffin and, and that's I think hopefully killed that, that argument pretty well dead. Now, 
you may think that it's not going to affect you as much um, because you only ride on the road. Um, you're not seeing that level of dry contamination. Uh, so affect you as much, correct. It won't affect you as much, but um, it's going to affect you still a lot, lot more than lubricants that remain proven really low friction because they do not absorb the contamination. There's still a lot of airborne uh, dust and so on and particles that are out there um, just in the air in your road cycling. That's why the lubricant still goes really black and, and gritty and dirty pretty quickly. So it's still going to wear um, and I guess absorb all that contamination out of the air and it's going to deliver you some really high wear rates. And, and even when we look at just the block one wear rates, that, that's still pretty obvious that overall from what we've tested, they're, they're way behind. And so if we have a look at it through, I guess, the really super unrealistic, impossible rose colored glasses of the muck off lens and say, you take it on faith. Let's say you're a big muck off fan, um, sponsored muck off athlete influence or whatever it may be. And you say, you know what, um, it's, it's all cool. I believe that despite the wear rates that this uh, silly guy from Zero Friction Cycling is, is talking about that as per what Muckoff say, there's no link of that to uh, the friction um, levels in the chain and that it's gonna be a super low friction um, and fast lubricant for my racing and, uh, and so on. So if you manage to take that, or like, that's a lot to take on faith um, from Muckoff that that is the case. Um, if you do manage to take that on faith uh, and believe that, how many can afford it? I mean, the wear rates versus the top five drip lubricants tested, uh, we're looking at basically around like 24 times the wear rate. That's, you know, and even versus a lot of mid-pack stuff, we're talking 10 times, even five times for some not, great, not so great uh, test lubricants. That's a huge amount of extra wear rate that you are taking uh, to your lovely drivetrain components that you will likely, most of us will have to pay good money to replace um, versus other options which are proven to deliver and remain super low uh, friction for just you know extremely long time across, across the test. So, and really I think it's been pretty well established from, if you have a look at the testing uh, video in episode 11, that you know really the top lubricants that Zero Friction Cycling has tested, we really, we do know they are really fast, they're really low friction, extremely efficient, and they're delivering you extremely low wear um, and they're very clean. So are you gonna take the fact that this lubricant may, may be really fast as well, but deliver you so many times greater the wear rate and be really black and dirty and gritty? That, that's your consumer choice if you're not a uh, yeah, sponsored um, Markov athlete. I know obviously which way I, I sort of recommend. So, all right, so this just leads me into, um, I guess, linking concern one and concern two. So, I, and this, I'm, I'm just using my own deduction here. So I believe that um, the base that they use for the Muckoff lubricants, which is really, as, as we've seen, it just absorbs so much contamination, so, you know, so readily and to a greater degree than anything else I've tested, that there's no way I don't think that Muckoff, uh, Muckoff would obviously know. Um, the user experience on the Muckoff lubricants is generally not, not amazing. I, I've certainly had a lot of contacts over the years to say, wow, I tried the Muckoff lubricants and holy Batman, your reviews were correct. These are really horrible to use because they do become really black and really dirty. So the three that I've tested are just so bad at that. Um, that, you know, the customer experience for that would not be amazing. So they would always needing, uh, be needing to get a lot of new customers in to try their products from their uh, you know, super marketing to replace the ones that have tried it, been really unhappy and, and bowed out and, and moved to something a lot cleaner um, and a lot more pleasurable to use. So why would they stay with that uh, as opposed to having something that is going to be really pleasurable to use? Um, you know, logically, you wouldn't. You know, if you can have, get a lot more of customers in through great marketing and keep them because they're happy with the product, it's a lot better than getting them in and always having to replace them. Being that the, the wear rate increase across those three products that I've tested is almost the same. We've got like 69%, 70%, and 71%. 
I believe that they're basically using the same base um, from when they sort of started with hydrodynamic to nano to, to ludicrous and that there may be some minor changes to it and obviously they've obviously been changing the friction modifiers. Um, look, I don't know, they could be completely different, but it, it's, it's a that's a super tight grouping to get for three different products to have almost the exact same wear rate increase in the dry contamination block too. So I think it's likely the same base. And the other reason why I think it's likely the same base is that um, I don't think it's that easy to get a base that is not affected by having no slackening time. Um, so to be able to use the completely, in my opinion, fudge testing that they've um, used for their marketing, which have highlighted through concern number one, to make that happen, I think they've had to find a base um, that's, you know, very particularly has the properties of not being affected by that no slackening time. So they can just use the testing on straight on the FTT machine. So they can show their lubricant to be great and competitive lubricants to be incorrectly uh, terrible. And that, that base just has the, you know, very not good side effect of absorbing a huge amount of contamination more so than anything else I've tested. So that I think concern one kind of links to concern two. Um, so now I could be could be wrong. I said I'm not. I've got no proof of of that at all. It just it you know at the end of the day to me we've got some sort of dots there, pretty much that sort of beg to be joined. And in the absence of information, you know, to the contrary from Markoff, I've just joined those those two dots. So um, yeah, again, let me know what what you uh, think there. Uh, think if I'm if I'm correct or not. I'll try to wrap it up there and um, yeah, just yeah, hopefully this all made a bit of sense and was hopefully a little bit more uh, not so all over the place as my, um, my uh, Michael Files part one video. But let me know what you think um, about, about all that. Uh, if you watch this and have time to, um, uh, to, to you know, take a comment or have some input, I'd love to know what um, you know, and I know that a lot of you that sort of uh, are watching this channel will be, you know, naturally on sort of mine or zero friction cycling side because you know and trust that what I'm doing is uh, is obviously completely independent, and that I'm here to highlight the best information I can. I'm, I'm really here to, you know, hold in a in a great spotlight the you know companies and manufacturers that are bringing genuinely great products to market, and this is what I recommend and. The, the best products are then what I, I stock on the retail side of zero friction cycling. And, you know, we need to hold some accountability to the manufacturers that I think are displaying the most concerning behavior. Um, and the worst products that are just gonna end up in you spending a ton of money on your drivetrain. So, you know, that's, that's a, I guess, a pretty big sort of part of what I do. Um, I prefer to focus more time on, you know, finding the top lubricants and, and telling good stories as opposed to something like this, but, yeah, this one's been uh, quite extraordinary. I think what is going on there is, is quite extraordinary and, uh, and really uh, not, not something that, that in general that we should abide. Uh, I think there, there needs to be a lot of accountability on that and I would love to see one cyclist hold some accountability uh, to, um, to muck off for this and I'd like to see two muck off actually answer some questions. Um, they've got all my questions, they've got as you would probably guess, pages of questions from me. Um, so I'd love to get some responses to that. And uh, yeah, we'll see where we go from here, but I don't think they'll bother responding. And I'm not going to, be, unless they do, and there's something for me to update, I, I don't want to do another one like this really for, for a bit. I want to sort of put a pin in this one and just we call muck off as it is. And let's, you know, we've got the information there if, if anyone asks about X, Y, Z on the muck off um, products and the testing we've got this to go to as to why I think what I think. So that will do on that. Thank you for watching if you made it all the way here. And yeah, please have some input and, um, and let's see, uh, yeah, see what your thoughts are. And don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to the channel and other YouTube type things like share with your friends. Uh, so that'll keep you up to date with the latest low friction news and hints and tips. And um, yeah, also put any comments down below and I can uh, try to look at those and uh, take them into account for future episodes. 